sons be glad. Your reward will be great in heaven. Alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he had sat down, his disciples came to him. He began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward will be great in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Today's Gospel is one of the most famous in all of the Bible. You may even know the title attached to it. At the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Uh, Jesus gives what are known as his Beatitudes. Uh, And some of you, I'm sure, may be able to recite them uh, from memory. Um, I can't. I have to read them all the time. But they're pretty. They sound good. But if we examine them, by examine, mean I mean listen, read, take them in, and ask whether any of this is actually real or true or I like any of it, If we do this, we will find that they are amongst the most challenging or offensive uh, phrases, words, from the mouth of Jesus. And you can start off by examining or looking at the word uh, blessed or blessed. In those ancient languages, uh, I'm drawing from Greek because that's the only one that I was uh, taught a little bit about, but... The same is true in Latin. Blessed means happy. It doesn't mean if you do this, your kindergarten teacher will give you a gold star and pat you on the head. This is not some kind of patronizing little uh, approval by God when we think, well, all the other boys and girls are doing something else, which I'd rather be doing. It's a far more bold claim that if you do these things, and even more importantly, if you are these things, in the end, in God's good time, you will be guaranteed God's brand of happiness. In the meantime, things may get difficult, as we hear at the very end. So the first reason why these Beatitudes are challenging or even repugnant is because Jesus dares to promise mere human beings a permanent, enduring form of happiness. And we look at these things, meekness, poverty, uh, hungering and thirsting, none of which sounds like a formula for happiness. So the challenge is, well, at least twofold. One is Jesus' way will actually get happy. And the hidden challenge is if you don't do it Jesus' way, 
how are you pursuing happiness? Because most people try to get it in one form or another. But the challenge is, if you're not doing it this way, you tell me, or actually tell the Lord, how right now, or when you go home, you are trying to procure some measure of happiness. That exercise in truth-telling can also be very difficult. Take any one of these, and you'll see that it's hard to wrap both heart and mind around. Uh, what's my favorite? Oh, my favorite is uh, mourning. Blessed are those they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, there are many ways to understand what Jesus is saying. The first is the obvious one. If there's something in your life that is making you sad, painfully sad, then the promise is you will be comforted. Now, that means someone else will provide you with comfort. We can always, we already see how this is a very unpleasant prospect. I want to provide my own comfort. I don't want to be dependent on somebody else to give me comfort in time of great sadness. You're asking me to open myself up to help. But that is what Jesus says. If you're sad, if you're crippled by sadness or even despair, there is help available but it comes from someone else. And then we have to decide, do I accept this odd form of help from someone else? Or do I say, thank you, but no, I'll find my own comfort. And how many of us, if we have been visited, use that old language, by a trauma or a sadness, find ways to comfort ourselves and then, of course, the cynical person inside of me will say, how's that working out for you? Human beings have tried it with varying degrees of success. But so often, it's not enough, and it doesn't satisfy. So the promise is, trust God, and in him, we will find enduring comfort. But the challenge is even greater than just trust God and he'll get around to making you feel better. In all of these uh, Beatitudes, especially the ones at the beginning, we can see at least two layers. One is bad stuff happens to you, God will help you. So if you happen to be sad, if you happen to be hungry right now because you have no food, if you happen to be meek, that is, if you happen to be unimportant, without financial resources, well, guess what? Good news, because God is willing to help you. But it gets even more interesting or tougher than that. When Christians begin to ask God for help in these areas, we grow in grace and in the capacity of our hearts to go from being people to whom these things happen. The people who choose to do these things. Now, what does that mean? Well, take mourning, for example. It's tough enough living as human beings to whom bad things happen. A loved one dies. I lose my job. I have a crippling accident. Those are all possible causes of mourning. And sure, we want help with that. And do we ask God for help? And does he actually come through and give us help? The voluntary kind of mourning comes when the Christian who right now isn't being hit by another car or by another tragedy looks at our lives, looks at our own lives, and, and then we realize, I have sinned. I have committed an act which is evil, which is abhorrent to God. I choose to mourn. In other words, I choose to regret to my heart that I have done this. Now, this may come with great emotion. It may come with no emotion. <laughs> we might not feel bad at all for do having done evil things. But we decide 
with the power of the mind and increasingly with the power of the heart. I will mourn the evil I have done and go and seek God's comfort, in this case, God's forgiveness. So there's the involuntary form of mourning. Bad stuff happens to you and you're in pain. Do you ask for help from God or not? And then there's the voluntary form. I don't feel bad right now. I, oh, but I've sinned. I guess I have sinned. I need to seek God's relief, God's mercy. Do we do this? The Christian who applies himself or herself to this kind of spiritual exercise. First, we ask God for help when the world hits us. But then we ask for help in the same general area when we don't feel a need, but we see a need and we act upon it. I mourn, I regret the evil I've done, and I want this to stop. I want God to heal me. So we go to confession and receive this great gift from God. Do we do this? Or just like people say, hey, I'll find my own comfort, thank you. Do we say to ourselves, I'm a good person. I haven't done anything really bad, so I don't mourn. And I don't need to ask God for any help. And these are decisions we have to make as disciples of Jesus Christ. All these beatitudes come with this potential, the potential to be made aware of our need, the potential to, to be made aware that there's help available and that we can reach out and actually get this help. And of course, the pitfalls of saying, um, no, I'll help myself, thank you, or there's nothing here to see. So I don't need your help. Which do we choose? Poverty is like that too. If right now you are poor, I mean, really poor, uh, then chances are you don't need to be convinced that there's pain. Go to God and ask for help. It can be anything from money help uh, to other forms of help that we need if we are impoverished. But then there's the voluntary kind. Suppose you are not. Uh, in uh, the old-fashioned term is penury. That means we're really dirt poor and can't even buy food, can't even buy clothing. People, you know, dump all over us. Suppose you're not one of those people. Then we look at our lives and say, though I could lie about my heart, I see that I am better off being poor in spirit. And poor in spirit means instead of feel, uh, filling my heart with all the stuff I want to fill it with, I throw it all out. All the things I want, all the people I like, all the people I hate, all the things that are, are, are worthy of my attention, all the things that I wish would leave my life. All those things get thrown out of my heart till my heart is a big vacuum. That kind of poverty word. I say, here's my heart. There's nothing in it. Lord, please come to me. To occupy this space within my life, which belongs to you. Most of the time, I put my idols in that space. But today, I'm going to be poor on purpose, throwing out these uh, possessions of mine so that you may come, occupy the space, and possess me. These are things that Christians aspire to, and they work on, and work on it long enough, and we become convinced of God's promise that this is the way to become blessed. Happy that you're alive. Happy that we belong to Christ. Happy that we are being helped. Happy that we are capable of asking for help, and that God is good. And because he is, we are becoming good. And that's just two of the Beatitudes. You look at their order, they get harder and harder. It's just like school. First you learn the basic ones, climb up the ladder, you get to the harder ones. 
by the time you get to the harder ones, if we've done what we were supposed to with the first ones, our hearts are stronger, our hearts are fuller, and our confidence in God's willingness and power to bless, to make happy, to make full, is stronger. So that by the time Jesus gets to the last ones, which require a tremendous amount of courage, trust in God, we can do these things. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. One of your priests here, Father St. Martin, years ago gave me a lesson in what this particular beatitude means. We just just fret about the part where people are being mean to us. They're bad-mouthing us. They're criticizing us. That is painful. But he said the real focus of this beatitude, if we want to be blessed, if we want to be happy that we're doing this, is at the end of the sentence. These mean people saying bad stuff about me have to be doing it falsely. In other words, if I slash your tires and you say bad stuff about me, that's okay because I did a bad thing and you told the truth. It's only when I don't do a bad thing and they tell lies about me, that fits this category. So false, if people are saying bad things and they're not true. And then because of me, meaning Jesus, To do this beatitude, people have to be lying about what you've done. And whatever it is you were supposed to have done has to have been done because of Jesus, not because of my own self-interest. You see how hard this beatitude is. Not only do I have to put up with other people's stupidity and their meanness, I have to make sure that whatever got them so angry about me was done because of Christ, in God's name, not because I was trying to get ahead in life. That's a hard one. That's why it's put at the very end of this list. But let's start at the beginning. The first one, the second one, the third, all of these provide us with plenty of opportunities to practice and to receive nourishment from Christ and instruction on how this all works, so that by the time we are being persecuted, we'll be ready. And not just for ourselves, not just so we can survive the experience, but so that by being blessed in this way, other people will look at us and say, you know, by all accounts, that person should be either dead or at least unhappy that we're doing all these bad things to him or her. Why are they maintaining this blessedness? Are they just stupid? Are they insane? Or are they now inhabited by a power which is giving them something we thought was impossible? Joy in the midst of suffering. Hope where they should have none and trust in a God who will save them. Remember, the Christian life is not just about getting by here. It is about receiving from God those gifts which will change us into the people who are ready to be happy permanently with God's So before we dismiss this list as a a nice sounding group of eight or nine or ten things that Jesus says the good boys and girls do, but which we mostly don't, please remember, Jesus never says anything that he doesn't mean. And he never says anything that he isn't convinced will build up his people into holy ones. We usually call them saints, but... People who are so imbued with God's good things that whether they're being complimented or criticized, whether they're being welcomed into people's homes 
or murdered, under all circumstances, we gain the power to praise God, we gain the power to thank Him for a life that is good by God's standards. And then through a power which we cannot provide, we gain the ability to become blessed, happy, glad, full of life. And for those saints, both the ones who are fully baked and the ones, well, like me, who are half-baked, we begin to wonder about other people, their happiness, their hopes, their mourning, their poverty. We pray fervently to God that the same blessedness that has been planted in me and is beginning to grow will also be planted in them. May we indeed be sons and daughters, good disciples, students of God's many ways of learning happiness. And once we have become even half convinced that this is a way of living, please share that good news with others who, whether they say so or not, whether they are nice to you or mean to you, whether they are pleasant to be around or just utterly repugnant, please know that in their hearts, whatever they're saying and doing, lies the desire to know that joy. If you have this confidence that comes from Christ, is planted in you, and then begins to reach out to others, with God's help, you will find a way to become even a little bit of a source of blessedness to someone else who really, really wants to know that their life, too, is good. Now, as the people of faith, let us together rise and profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered a death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the Pope's monthly intention, we pray that educators may be credible witnesses teaching fraternity rather than competition in helping the youngest and most valuable, excuse me, vulnerable above all. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Bishop Sean, that he may help the church understand 
more how to offer, help orphans, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those taking part in the NCOD conference, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who are sick or in distress in any way, especially those listed in the bulletin, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the repose of the souls of the faithful departed, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And today, we pray in a special way for Maria Dos Santos Cuto and family for whom this Mass is being celebrated. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we thank you that you would shower down upon us the good news that your son's suffering and death and resurrection may bring us true and eternal happiness. Through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, through the intercession of Saint Jude, both of whom knew great pain and suffering, but who now reside in joy, may we also come to be like them and with them in your eternal blessedness. All this we ask through Christ our Lord. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. O oh Lord, we bring to your altar these offerings of our service. Be pleased to receive them, we pray, and transform them into the sacrament of our redemption through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, for when your children were scattered afar by sin, through the blood of your Son and the power of the Spirit, you gathered them again to yourself, that a people formed as one by the unity of the Trinity made the body of Christ in the temple of the Holy Spirit, might to the praise of your manifold wisdom 
be manifest as the church. And so, in company with the choirs of angels, we praise you, as in joy we proclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are for your glory, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. <laughs> You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples saying, take this all of you and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we, who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son, and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with Saint Jude, and with all the saints on whose this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, 
with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Sean, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family, a compassion, a merciful Father. Gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who were pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory. Through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ, where the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now. And Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer to one another a sign of God's peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, my soul shall be healed. Thank you. 
persecution in vacium tuor. Prater justitia, coniam ipsorum est regnum Keep silence and with fear and trembling stand. Ponder nothing earthly minded, for with blessing in his hand, Christ our God to earth is should demand. King of kings, yet born of Mary, as of old on earth he stood, Lord of lords in human vesture, in the body to all the faithful, his own self for heavenly food. Rank on rank the host of heaven spreads its vanguard on the way as the light of light did Descendeth from the realms of endless day, that the powers of hell may vanish as the darkness clears away. At his feet, the six winged seraph. Cherubim with sleepless eye Veil their faces to the presence As with ceaseless voice they cry Alleluia, 